Happy New Year. Welcome to the city of Somerville. As soon as the city officials are lined up, we'll start the ceremony. You are here to observe the 244th anniversary of the formation of the Continental Army, the raising of the great Union flag, and the feasibility for us to be a new country. Stand by. Commanders, bring your units to attention and present arms for the city of Somerville officials and dignitaries. Commanders, bring your units to order arms and at ease and pay attention to this to the podium. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I did like to start by wishing you all a happy new year. So and what better way to start this new year than by, than by commemorating what it is that we all hold and pursue in common. We are going to say a word about that in just a second. But first, I did like to welcome you all to our historic city of Somerville. I'm Wilfred Ba, I'm one of the city councilors at large for the city. Today, I'm speaking to you on behalf of your ward councilor, Ben Ewing Campen, who is here with us today, and also on behalf of the city council of Somerville. On behalf of the council and the residents of this great city, I did like to suggest that to you that the flag we are, will be raising soon is a beautiful symbol of what it is that we all hold and pursue in common. Of course, it is a cold winter day. Oh, it's cold. Especially if you are from Cameroon, like me. So let's consider just two reasons why this flag is such a beautiful symbol. One historic reason and one very contemporary reason. First, the historic reason. As many of you may recall from your school days, this is the Grand Union flag, the very first flag of the 13 United Colonies, stretching all the way from New Hampshire and Massachusetts down to South Carolina and Georgia. This flag was raised on this hill on New Year's Day. 1776 by General George Washington, raised for the American forces, besieging the British Red Coat in Boston. And because Prospect Hill is quite elevated, we know that the Red Coat saw this flag. Soon enough, the British forces will evacuate Boston, and shortly after the American victory, the Continental Congress meeting in Philadelphia will issue the Declaration of Independence on the 4th of July, 1776. What an inspiring history. And that inspiration is not just history. No, the sense of a Union flag and all that it represents is very much a contemporary reality. The 13 stripes on the Grand Union flag were retained from New Year's Day, 1776, all the way to today, because they represent the 13 colonies which we became the first 13 states of this United States. A new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. 13 stripes also symbolizing everyone, whether born in Somerville then or born in America long after, or like me, born elsewhere an immigrating year, where we can all work together to advance our liberty and equality. Ladies and gentlemen, our Constitution states an elementary fact. It says right at the onset that we came together to form a more perfect union, to change and to grow, just as our flag has changed and grown from 13 stars to 50 stars. But we kept the original 13 stripes 
from this Grand Union flag. So as to remind ourselves, no matter how humble or how different our origins, if we keep our ideals in unity, then we shall indeed create a more perfect union. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the first symbol of our unity in liberty and equality. Have a beautiful day. Thank you. The words of Samuel Langton, Doctor of Divinity, President of Harvard College. This day is sacred to liberty. On this, the people from year to year have assembled on this day from all of our towns in a vast congregation of gladness and festivity with every ensign of joy displayed in our metropolis. Our metropolis is now, alas, made a garrison of mercenary troops and made a stronghold of despotism. We have lived to see the time when British liberty is just ready to expire. Our constitution of government, which has so long been the glory and the strength of the English nation, has been deeply undermined and is ready to tumble into ruin. America is threatened with cruel oppression and the arm of power is stretched out against New England and especially this colony. This oppression wishes to compel us to submit to the arbitrary acts of our legislators who are not our representatives and will not themselves bear the least part of the burdens which, without mercy, they are laying upon us. Before the face of this oppression, we light the beacon of liberty. We will raise our flag. Our late happy government is char changed into the terrors of military execution. Our firm opposition to the establishment of an arbitrary system is called rebellion, and we are to expect no mercy, but are expected to yield property and life. The King George has recently told us that our love of liberty precludes our love for him. The king and his ministers will not have us speak of liberty. Every nation, when able and agreed, has a right to set up over themselves any form of government which to them may appear more conductive to their common welfare as it was for the children of Israel and it is for our forefathers. We are therefore resolved and have taken arms in our own defense and all of the colonies are united in this great cause of liberty. This is the first flying of our flag the new flag for America, an America soon to be bathed in liberty and free from oppression. Great and extensive will be the happy effects of this warfare for a new America, for an America born near this place, tested and now proved at this place. May the Lord hear us on this day of display May he defend us, send us help from his sanctuary, and give us strength as we set up our banner. Amen. 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 Ah, ah. Ah! Good afternoon and Happy New Year. I hope you enjoyed the ringing in of 2020 New Year. My name is Katiana Ballantyne. I'm president of the Somerville City Council, 
and City Councilor for Ward 7. The Mayor sends his regrets, but he couldn't be here today. And I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Councilor at Large Stephanie Hirsch, who's with us. I wish you all a Happy New Year. I hope that your holiday season has been joyful, and I wish you all the very best for an excellent year in 2020. Thank you all, and welcome to Prospect Hill in Somerville, Massachusetts, for the 240th, 44th anniversary of the first raising of the Grand Union flag. Thank you to the many individuals who work to remind us of our history, the Somerville Historical Preservation Commission, the Somerville Museum, all the militia that have gathered here, and especially thank you to Brandon Wilson for her excellent work to keep, to keep our collective historical memories alive. I applaud you all. It is wonderful to see so many of you here today to reenact this important history. I can't imagine any better way to honor the memory of the people who raised the first flag of our new union than this event and this reenactment. That this first flag was raised in a time of uncertainty, a symbol of hope for a better future. The details of how to prosecute a war against a world power and the details of how to form a union and a new government must have been unclear to those first unionists. After all, they were deciding to stand together against the single most powerful nation in the world and in all of history at that time. They were about to form a federal republic based upon radical ideas, including values of individual liberty and individual rights. However, the broad parameters of the situation must have been absolutely apparent. The unionists would either stand together to fight for their values, or they would fail. They would either establish a representative government for themselves, or they would be governed by another without representation. One thing above all else would have been clear on this day, 244 years ago, that the Unionists might fight success by struggling together, but they would definitely find only failure if they could not unite. We honor this history also by fighting for our values today as ordinary people willing to speak out, to challenge present injustice. We honor the history this day by helping our neighbors. Whether it was 300 years ago, 50 years ago, last week or next week, whether it is in our cities and towns, our state or federal government, we honor this historic moment by continuing to fight for individual liberty, and for our union, our grand union. Freedom requires great effort and also respect for our union. Still, need to do, we need to speak out because challenges to our values haven't changed. Every year, every day, we in Somerville work for individual liberty and individual rights. We stand here together today to honor the spirit and the meaning and the values represented by the first grand flag of our union. We honor the great courage, spirit, tenacity of those first American unionists with this reenactment and with our daily participation in our cities, our states, and in the United States. Thank you. Good morning, all. It is wonderful to see you all gathered here today for this historic occasion. Uh, yes, it is cold, even for those of us not from Cameroon. Um, but if you think back on those times, it was probably a whole lot colder, and we've done this event when it was a whole lot colder, wetter, and nastier weather. So, grim up. <laughs> um, 
So today we have the opportunity to hear from a host of different people that we've invited to be here to tell you about this historic occasion that occurred right here in our community on Prospect Hill. And as a reminder of that, we are today uh, gathered on the street instead of in this park because it is being renovated. And we're all very excited for you to come this spring when we open it to the public again. Um, but in the meantime, it will be very much a testament to um, the care that we have about keeping our history alive here in Somerville. Uh, this event is historic event is also indicative of the pioneering spirit of this community in many, many respects. And I hope that you all that are here today um, will take the time to remember all the firsts that we've had done here in Somerville. Um, I would now like to introduce some of the speakers that we've gathered together to give you a little bit of a sense, if you went back in history, um, what might have transpired during that time. Um, the first person uh, that I'd like to ask to come up is Captain Tom Coots. He is the commander of the Charlestown Militia, which is part of the Gardner's Regiment. They are veterans of the Bunker Hill um, battles and one of the first of assigned to defend this very hill. We are also fortunate to have representatives today here from Glover's Marblehead Regiment, Captain Seamus Day commanding, and also from the Bedford Militia, uh, Captain Jim Ringwood commanding. Uh, you're not up on stage, so if you're in the crowd, if you could come up, that would be great. <laughs> For that further ado, I'd like Tom Coots to come up as the captain of the Charlestown Militia. Thank you, Brandon. Greetings one and all. On behalf of the Charlestown Militia Company of Colonel Thomas Gardner's Regiment, allow me to extend both a holiday and paternal greetings to you all. We celebrate this annual event not just to commemorate the raising of the Grand Union flag, but also the events that led up to that momentous occasion. It was in April of 1775 when a British expedition was sent out to confiscate military stores in Lexington and Concord. An alarm was sounded and it brought close to 20,000 militiamen to the vicinity of the Cambridge Common. On June 14th of 1775, General Artemis Ward, General Israel Putnam, Colonel John Stark, and Colonel William Prescott met in a war council at Ward's headquarters on the Cambridge Common. The outcome of that war council resulted in the June 16th march of 1,200 men under the leadership of Colonel Prescott, marching from Cambridge Common to the top of Bunker Hill. Upon their arrival, Colonel Prescott realized that building fortifications on Bunker Hill presented little threat to the British who were occupied in Boston. Instead, he decided to fortify nearby Breeds Hill, where a colonial-built readout would be visible to the British in Boston. By the next morning, the British realized the colonial forces had taken a menacing position, and they immediately began preparations to dislodge Colonel Prescott and his 1,200 men. The British were now provoked into action. Back in Cambridge, General Artemis Ward feared that a second landing at Leechmer Point would take place, and he so ordered Gardner's Regiment to occupy that position in Cambridge. By noon of June 17th, the British intentions were revealed. Colonel Gardner realized that the major attack was commencing on Breed's Hill and not in Cambridge. Gardner's Regiment vacated Leechmere's Point and marched across Charlestown Neck to the Charlestown Peninsula. Gardner arrived at the top of Bunker Hill with his regiment, which was made up of 10 companies of militia. There he was met by General Israel Putnam. Putnam sent two of Gardner's companies over the stone wall to the edge of the Mystic River where the fiercest of fighting was taking place. Gar Putnam also took one company to defend the path and the rest stayed at the top of the hill. At this point, the readout was under attack by British regulars for the third time inflicting devastating casualties on the British for the first two assaults, though they had been repulsed by colonial forces. They now were out of powder and ball. Suffering hundreds of casualties themselves, the colonial forces began a retreat from Breed's Hill. Gardner's regiment provided covering fire, which allowed Colonel Prescott and his men a safe and orderly retreat from Breed's Hill onto and across Bunker Hill. 
During the action, Colonel Gardner suffered a wound from a musket ball that would later prove fatal. Colonel Thomas Gardner died on July 3rd, 1775. Gardner's regiment, along with the retreating colonial forces, made their way from Bunker Hill to the fortifications here on Prospect Hill. Prospect Hill held a commanding view that stretched from Charlestown Neck to Leechmere Point. The Charlestown Militia Company of Gardner's Regiment, now under the command of Colonel William Bond, remained stationed here on Prospect Hill until the British were forced to evacuate Boston by General Washington on March 17, 1776. In the summer of 1775, General George Washington took command of this fledgling Continental Army. The siege of Boston was well underway. He knew that he needed a way to unite the individual militia regiments into one cohesive army. As summer became autumn and autumn became winter, morale was low. The soldiers had not been paid and many wished to go home. For many, their enlistments ended on January 1st. To this point, reconciliation with the king was unsuccessful. The future was uncertain here in the colonies. General Washington needed a flag for his soldiers to follow. Earlier that year, he asked Congress to commission a flag. That new flag finally had arrived. Thus, the Grand Union flag was born. It had 13 alternating red and white stripes representing the 13 United Colonies and the British Union Jack in the Canton. On January 1st, 1776, General George Washington had the Grand Union flag raised at the most visible point of all fortifications here on Prospect Hill. It was done under the watchful guardianship of Gardner's regiment. Today, we as reenactors of Gardner's regiment proudly participate in this re-raising of our first flag. The flag of the United Colonies has been added to our color guard and has flown at our reenactments. Today, at the end of this program, Gardner's regiment will once again unfurl our Grand Union flag and fire a musket volley to commemorate, commemorate this great occasion. Thank you for coming, and God bless America. Thank you, Captain Coots. Um, this was from the Massachusetts militia. Everyone had a role to play in this important scene. Now I would like to invite someone from the Rhode Island militia to come up which is Colonel Richard Schrecker. He is the former commander of the Kentish Guards, and they were chartered back in 1774. Brigadier General Nathaniel Green was a member of the Kentish Guards, and they were one of George Washington's ablest commanders. He commanded the forces on Prospect Hill during 1775 and 1776. Please come up, Colonel Schrecker. Thank you. Uh, the Kentish Guards, by the way, refers to Kent County, Rhode Island. I'm a member of the Kentish Guards, Nathaniel Green's home unit. And on behalf of the Rhode Islanders who are stationed here in the newly reconstituted Continental Army in, on January 1st, 1776, I thank you for participating and witnessing these ceremonies, important for us to remember the significance of this location, both locally, statewide, and nationally, even internationally, for all the ideals of American democracy that it represents as a beacon for the rest of the world. Here we celebrate this Continental Army revival and its first raising before the Army of the United Colonies flag, the Grand Union flag, approved by the Second Continental Congress on November 1775, symbolizing the united purpose of all the colonies in defense of our lives, liberties, and rights. I'm here to, to honor uh, those from Rhode Island who fully served here on Prospect Hill, the, the critical keystone to the American line during the siege of Boston from June 1775 to March 1776. Shortly after the Battle of Bunker, Bunker Hill, 
Brigadier General Nathaniel Green arrived in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He was command, commander of the three Rhode Island Regiment's uh, Army of Observation raised by the Rhode Island Colonial Legislature in answer to Watson's call for aid. Rhode Islanders played an important role in the Continental Army throughout the American Revolution. Uh, for instance, the Kennedy Guards commander, uh, James uh, Barnum, became the commander of one of these three regiments, as well as 35 members of the Kennedy Guards became officers in the Continental Army. General George Washington took command of the fledgling Continental Army on July 3, 1775. He wrote that everywhere there was insubordination with the militia over imbued with the spirit of liberty. But then he visited the camp of the Rhode Island regiments and he noted that here there was order and discipline, down to the tenth peg, a place Brigadier General Nathaniel Green in charge of Prospect Hill, the key position in the American line, with 4,000 men, including the, the three Rhode Island regiments and Gardner's Massachusetts regiment. Why was Rhode Island so superior at this moment in history? Massachusetts did not lack for strong and brave men. Massachusetts did not lack for able and experienced leaders. All your problems resulted from having a royal military governor and an occupying, occupying troops here aggressively seeking to seize your weapons and your ammunition and your leaders. Rhode Island did not have a royal governor an example which we hardly hope you would also adopt. On a Monday, January 1st, 1776, under George Washington's leadership, the Continental Army re-enlisted a majority of its members, thus allowing its survival. The raising of our first flag, the Grand Union flag, here on Prospect Hill before the Continental Army and in the face of the British Army and under the watchful guardianship of General George Washington symbolized our continued and united resolve to be free and independent. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I can't help but point out to you that the clothing that many of those militia are wearing are authentic to those times. So if you want to think about what it might have been like during those times, they're all wearing wool, so they're a whole lot warmer than most of you that are not. <laughs> also, I noticed that on his buttons that they has KG for Kentish Guard, 1774. Is that part of the original costume? <laughs> Wonderful. Um, <laughs> yeah, clothing, excuse me. So, um, what would a revolution be without having an opposing view? Uh, I now have the pleasure to bring up um, some people that have some opposing uh, views about this whole situation, and we always look forward to their uh, arrival, and they will have some spirited uh, commentary, I'm sure, to give. I would now like to introduce the British forces. Um, they served King George III, and today they are represented, as they have been for several years now, by Colonel Paul O'Shaughnessy. He is a member of Her Majesty's 10th Regiment of Foot. And if you think that we have some wonderful historic clothing, wait till you see theirs. <laughs> I love you all, too. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. I do want to open my remarks by reminding all of you, good people of Massachusetts and Rhode Island, that it is not too late to turn back from this perilous course that you have set upon. His Majesty and the government are waiting with open arms to welcome you back into the fold. 
I believe that it is appropriate, and I do thank Mr. Washington for this opportunity, to bring you His Majesty's glorious speech of last October, so that you do know His Majesty's mind in full on these matters, and the determination of government to right this wrong against the British Empire and its loyal citizens. This is an excerpt from His Majesty's most glorious speech to both Houses of Parliament on Friday, the 27th of, June, of October in 1775. My lords and gentlemen, those who have successfully labored to inflame my people in America by gross misrepresentations and to infuse into their minds a system of opinions repugnant, repugnant to the true constitution of the colonies and to their subordinate relation to Great Britain, now openly avow their revolt, hostility, and rebellion. They have raised troops. They are collecting a naval force. And most importantly, they have seized the public revenue. They always do that. Many of these unhappy people may still retain their loyalty, yet the torrent of violence has been so strong as to compel their acquiescence until a sufficient force shall appear to support them. The authors and promoters of this desperate conspiracy have meant only to amuse by vague expressions of attachment to the parent state and protestations of loyalty to me, whilst all the while preparing for a general revolt. On our part, the resolutions of Parliament have breathed a spirit of moderation and forbearance. I have acted with the same temper, anxious to prevent the effusion of blood of my subjects and the calamities which are inseparable from a state of war, still hoping that my people in America will discern the traitorous views of their leaders. To be a subject of Great Britain, with all of its consequences, is to be the freest member of any civil society in the known world. The rebellious war now levied has become more general and is manifestly carried on for the purpose of establishing an independent empire. I need not dwell upon the fatal effects of such a plan. The object is too important, the spirit of the British nation too high, the resources with which God hath blessed her too numerous to give up so many colonies, which she has planted with great industry, nursed with great tenderness, encouraged with many commercial advantages, and protected and defended at much expense of blood and treasure. When the unhappy and deluded multitude, that's you, <laughs> shall become sensible of their error, I shall be ready to receive the misled with tenderness and mercy to remove as soon as possible the calamities that they, which they suffer, I shall give authority to grant general and particular problems and indemnities, and to receive the submission of any province or colony which shall be disposed to return to its allegiance as if such colony or province had never revolted. Spoken these days, this day in London in October of 1775, God save His Majesty the King. Three cheers for His Majesty. Hip hip. Huzzah! Hip hip. Huzzah! Huzzah! I didn't hear you. <laughs> Sir, oh, we have a heckler. Yes. On behalf of General Washington, you speak of the outstretched arms of the sovereign. I do. And yet, all that we see is outstretched beyond us is your navy encircling our ports, choking off our commerce, and preventing us from commerce and the natural flow of information and continuity amongst our colonies. There is a simple path back, sir. You remember, you forget that loyalty and respect are two-way streets. When you respect the rule of law and his majesty and the government, these fleets will disappear as if they had never arrived in the first place. All will be well, and you shall go forward into Pax Britannica, and we shall have a peaceful world. The Colonel, we hear your words of peace and 
You're clearly upset. What can I do? Perhaps you should have a cup of tea. Well, unfortunately, <laughs> while the harbor is full of tea, most of us have become coffee drinkers. <laughs> At some point, we can reach one of our local establishments. It's a vile drink. I recommend against it. Rum is much better, and I believe you New Englanders are quite good at that, too. Well, perhaps oh, that, stop! So Very good, sir. I thank you all for this opportunity, and remember, we're just a quick trip across the harbor anytime you'd like to drop in. Thank you very much. We can always count on the British for a lively exchange. <laughs> Um, okay, proceeding um, with one last speaker uh, before you can all warm up with some songs and merriment. Um, I would now like to invite to come to the um, podium someone that's representing the ancient and honorable artillery company of Massachusetts. Um, they are currently headquartered at Faneuil Hall in Boston and they were originally chartered by Governor John Winthrop in 1638 to train leaders for the Massachusetts militia. Its members have served proudly in the armed forces of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and the United States of America. The current captain commanding of the Ancients is Nicholas Trozzi. <laughs> he's he's going to be away. And the speaker, however, today will be Colonel Lawrence A. Wilworth who is the quartermaster as well as the commander of troops today. Lawrence is a citizen soldier, a combat veteran, and a lifelong Somerville resident. He will provide comment on the further historic, historic significance of this event that are connected with the raising of the first United Colonies flag here on January 1776. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon Wilson. Um, just to let you know that in 244 years ago, there were 4,000 soldiers stationed on this hill in a fortification. General Green was the commander. As we assemble here today to commemorate our history and heritage, the current weather, winter weather conditions today, and a lot colder and damper, in the, in the past, is a reminder of the continual hardships and extreme conditions those brave soldiers of the American Revolution endured. But let us always remember and never forget the brave men and women of our military currently in harm's way under similar or worse conditions without the benefit of comfort, of home, security, that are there protecting our freedoms. As referenced earlier, over 244 years ago in December 1775, the siege of Boston had gone on for eight long months. Any clear outcome with the British was not in sight, and reconciliation with the king had been unsuccessful. The soldiers' morale was low. They wanted to go home. It was winter, and their enlistments were ending December 31st, 1775. Under these conditions, how would it be possible to create a new Continental Army on January 1st, 1776, reorganized in the middle of battle and in front of a British army of over 8,000 soldiers. Concurrently on Monday, January 1st, 1776, General William Howe, 
commander of the British forces in Boston, directed copies of the King's speech to Parliament, which you heard uh, addressed a few moments ago, declaring the colonies in revolt to be distributed through the American siege lines to each American soldier. As a reminder who you belong to. In direct response, General George Washington directed to the new flag, the Great Union, currently being presented to his staff, be displayed from the highest visible point in the American lines, the fortification at Prospect Hill. In addition, he addressed, okay, we will not be intimidated. The display of this flag confirmed the successful reorganization of the Continental Army and the American determination to maintain their independent identity. By January 1776, the pessimism of a month before had changed into a firm resolve. The colonists, formerly angry British citizens, had been transformed into independent Americans. The Continental Army was successfully reorganized from a militia army to a professional army with most of the soldiers re-enlisting and deciding to stay the course of the eight long years of the Revolutionary War. Later in January, under the leadership of Henry Knox, in severe winter conditions, 59 cannons and 60 tons of supplies captured at Fort Ticonderoga were sledged the 150 miles to Boston. The resulting sudden emplacement of these guns on Dorchester Heights two months hence in March 1776 forced a premature British evacuation of Boston and a victory for the Continental Army. The first major victory of the Revolution, combined with the publication of Tom Paine's Common Sense, made each citizen realize that independence was a possibility. The Ancient and Honorable Artillery Company, since 1638, has a proud tradition of supporting the Commonwealth and the country. We are here today to honor its fellow members who were present in the Continental Army along the siege of Boston in the American Revolution. Most likely present at the raising of this flag was Major General William Heath and Major William Dawes. General Heath, 92nd Captain Commanding of the Ancient and Honorable Artillery Company in 1771, was one of Washington's original six brigade commanders. Major Dawes was instrumental in spreading the alarm on 1819 April and later fought at Bunker Hill. Thank you very much and God bless America. Thank you, Lawrence. Lawrence is my comrade in helping and organize the events today, so thank you again. Okay, so just to get everybody warm, feet stomping, and again alive, I'd like to have everybody join in in songs. <clears throat> the songs will be led once again by our own David Scott, who is a Prospect Hill resident um, and a teacher and a professor at the Berkeley School of Music. He will lead us in songs. You all of you <clears throat> um, that received a program, hopefully, the songs are included in there. I also sent around other sheets for those um, that didn't maybe get a program or want one, um, and hopefully you'll share together the songs. So that we do not confuse the song sheets with the King's speech, I think it's appropriate that we burn the speech. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Hard to disagree with that after that rendition that we had from them today. Thank you. Yes. Hard to catch fire on a day with so much wind. <laughs> so this is your answer. <laughs> I take it that's a no. <laughs> 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 the, the words are tougher than we thought. <laughs> Thank you. 
must be a very strong dog. <laughs> <laughs> so, you're up to something once again. <laughs> So there. <laughs> Please join in, clap your hands, stomp your feet, sing out in your loudest voice. We want to show the Redcoats and King George that here on Prospect Hill, we know how to party like it's 1776. Father and I went down to camp along with Captain Gooding, and there we see the men and boys as thick as hasty pudding. Yankee Doodle, keep it up, Yankee Doodle dandy. Find the music and the step, and with the girls be handy. And there we see a thousand men as rich as Squire David, and what they wasted every day, I wish it had been saved. Yankee Doodle, keep it up. Yankee Doodle Dandy, find the music and the step, and with the girls be handy. And there we see plumping gun large as a log of maple, upon a deuced little cart, a load for Lotta's cattle. Yankee Doodle, keep it up, Yankee Doodle Dandy. Find the music and the step, and with the girls be handy. And every time they shoot it off, it takes a horn of powder and makes a noise like father's gun, only a nation louder. Yankee Doodle, keep it up, Yankee Doodle dandy. Find the music and the step, and with the girls be handy. And there was Captain Washington and gentle folks about him. They say he's grown so tarnal proud he will not ride without them. Yankee Doodle, keep it up. Yankee Doodle dandy. Find the music and the step and with the girls be handy. Yankee Doodle, keep it up. Yankee Doodle dandy. Find the music and the step and with the girls be handy. The next song is a bit of an anachronism, but it's still very appropriate for this day. If I had a hammer, I'd hammer in the morning, I'd hammer in the evening, all over this land. I hammer out danger, I hammer out warning, I hammer out love between my brothers and my sisters. All over this land. Mm -hmm. If I had a bell, I'd ring it in the morning, I'd ring it in the evening. All over this land, I'd ring out danger, I'd ring out warning, I'd ring out love between my brothers and my sisters. All over this land, oh, 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 if I had a song, I'd sing it in the morning, and I'd sing it in the evening, all over this land, I'd sing out a danger, I'd sing out a warning, I'd sing out love between my brothers and my sisters, all over this land, oh, 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 well, I've got a hammer, and I've got a bell, and I've got a song to sing all over this land. It's the hammer of justice, it's the bell of freedom, it's the song about love between my brothers and my sisters. All over this land. Yes, peace between brothers. 
Okay, now we would like to introduce um, Brigadier John, General John Driscoll. He is the Land Forces Commander of the Massachusetts National Guard. He's also the Senior Military Advisor to the Adjutant General and the Governor of Massachusetts and the Commander of all Army National Guard Military Forces. The Massachusetts National Guard is the nation's first and has a proud tradition of service to the citizens of the Commonwealth as well as this nation since 1636. Thank you. So greetings from the Continental Congress. As a senior land forces commander of Massachusetts and in behalf of Benjamin Franklin's recommendation and direction of the Continental Congress, a New England Continental Army of 26 regiments has been created. We are highly pleased with the continuing improvements of the, of the Army under the leadership demonstrated by General George Washington. I am fully confident of its success in the future. I travel to this event today to show support for General Washington and his new Continental Army and to present him with the first United Colonies flag the Great Union. This flag forevermore will symbolize the unity and purpose of the 13 colonies in united support of the new Continental Army. On behalf of the Second Continental Congress, I hereby present this flag to you, General George Washington, as a new symbol of national identity to be displayed at the most visible point for all to see. Commanders, bring your unit to attention and present arms for General George Washington. by the Second Continental Congress, Commander of the Continental Army, this day, Monday, January 1st, 1776, giving commencement to the new Army, which in every point of view is entirely Continental. His Excellency hopes that the importance of the great cause we are engaged in will be deeply impressed upon every man's mind. Let us, therefore, when everything dear and valuable to free men is at stake, when our unnatural parent is threatening us with destruction from every quarter, endeavor by all skill and discipline in our power to acquire that knowledge and that conduct which is necessary in war it is discipline that is the life and soul of an army which under providence is to make us formidable to our enemies, honorable in ourselves, and respected in the world. Commander, bring your units to order arms and attention. Mr. Henry Knox is making great progress with the noble train of artillery, the heavy siege guns from Fort Ticonderoga. I expect him to arrive with the 58 guns this very month. Future historians will marvel at his achievement and will compare it to Hannibal crossing the Alps. Rest assured, those guns will speak loudly very soon. I hereby direct that the new Union flag be raised most to the most visible position in the American lines, Prospect Hill. That is all.
bungalow. Sound the colors for the raising of the new flag. I will now have the President of the Council lead you in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Commanders, bring your units to order arms and... Um, we'll now have the final song today, uh, again led by David Scott, and very much in um, the atmosphere, the philosophy of today, which is peace be with us. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her. To the night, breath the light from above, from the mountains to the prairies, to the oceans white with foam. God bless America, my home, sweet home. God. America, my home, sweet home. Let there be peace on earth, and let it begin with me. Let there be peace on earth. The peace that was meant to be With God as our Father We are family Let us walk with each other In perfect harmony Let peace begin with me let this be the moment now. With every step I take, let this be my solemn vow. To take each moment and live each moment in peace eternally. Let there be peace on earth. And let it begin with me. Okay. Uh, before we leave today, and there's one more thing to come, I do want to make sure to acknowledge um, the help that we've gotten to make this all happen today. And that is particularly um, the DPW, the Parks and the Building Department. <laughs> done an awesome job making sure that all the changes that we needed to incorporate this year because of the relocation from the park, um, particularly. Um, also in the program, you'll notice there are a number of other local businesses that have contributed food to today and the refreshments. Um, I also particularly want to thank um, a woman and a, a organization that has been part of this ceremony since I started it over 20 years ago, which is Evelyn Battinelli and the Somerville Museum. And Diane and Richard Blewett, who are stolidly standing over there giving you out refreshments and reminding you about some of the memorabilia you can purchase to show your Somerville pride. So I hope you'll go by there. Um, in addition to that, 
Um, there is the uh, Larry Wilworth, who is my comrade here in coming up with a lot, working with the militia of all the different um, groups who have been invited here today. Um, and lastly, of course, there are all the people, the, the militia that are here today um, that have joined in to remind us about the proud heritage of the city of Somerville right here on Prospect Hill. So thank you all. Um, again, I hope you will enjoy refreshments um, and mingle, and we will be taking some pictures after this with some of the people. So. Please stay around. Lawrence? Commander! Please appropriately address your new flag! a very special occasion because as you know um, during the most of the year the Prospect Hill Tower is not open but we on January 1st open it every year and to the year is no exception so if you would like to go up in the tower and enjoy the views and understand why this was chosen by George Washington in order to um, be this prominent hill here you'll understand why so feel free to go up on there enjoy some refreshments and again thank you very much all for participating today and being proud uh, Somerville residents.